the question I asked Joel is, um, what are your views on things like basic conditions of employment in formal work? So it, it, it's important to realize that the idea of a job is actually sort of a fairly new idea that before the Industrial Revolution, people worked but did not have a job. I mean, in the sense that they had a permanent connection with a single employer, that they showed up for work um, at, at a given time and left at a, at, a, at a later time. And so people worked, but most of the vast bulk of people worked for themselves at their homes or in their fields. And that changed during the Industrial Revolution, which is why we call it the factory system, so to speak. And, uh, you know, it's had advantages and disadvantages, but I would say it deprived people of sort of a fundamental freedom of choosing where they work and when they work. Now, if you, then, if you work, you know, the, you, you can choose the times and the spaces which you work. It gives you a certain freedom that you don't have if you work for a factory. I think economists have always realized that. We are, thanks to modern technology, some large segment of the labor force, and I hope a, a, a growing segment, is going to return to something akin to what we had before the Industrial Revolution, except without, of course, the, the poverty and, and, and the insecurity uh, of those times. And I think that's a very positive development. Um, people always whine about modern technology and what it's doing to us. It's capable of giving us the kind of freedom humans have sort of lost as a result of the Industrial Revolution. That, I think, is an extremely mm -hmm. positive development. Now, I hasten to add, if I may, just one more sentence. That is probably not going to apply to everybody. It is at the moment applying to a segment of the population that have access to, to a Wi-Fi and to, and to broadband and that can work from home, uh, whereas other people still have to work in person. But I actually think we're moving to a, in a direction which technology will be able to extend this to increasing segments of the labor force. It probably, there will always be people who will be outside that system. You know, if you are, you know, a chef in a restaurant or a proctologist, it will be hard to work uh, uh, remotely. But for a growing number of people, uh, even people you'd be surprised to hear about, uh, this may become a reality. And I think this is, this is a very positive development. Yes, I think also there are many things that change just because of us working remotely, for example, have being able to have the Zoom session with you. Um, all of this has been enabled through, through the um, actual pandemic. Uh, Chris, I'd like to ask you a question about the psychological health um, and the need for human connection, whether you think that is really relevant for, for future of employment and what are your opinion on, on this whole soft issue, if I, if I may put it that way. I uh, thank you very much for uh, for the question involving me involving me on this. Um, I mean, I do think what they're known as soft skills and um, uh, you know social uh, training and all that are going to be increasingly important. There is already evidence coming out that um, if you take people with only basic um, kind of education, I'm, I'm talking about British state actually that the basic education who are going into jobs in the service sector now, because obviously manufacturing and uh, other production industries are not employing hardly any young people anymore. Then those who have uh, better social skills, uh, be it uh, talking on the telephone or <clears throat> meeting uh, customers, having better manners and all that, uh, have both better career uh, progression and uh, get paid more. Now, the reason for that is quite easy to understand. It's because um, more and more jobs are getting automated, uh, but not the ones that, are, um, that involve direct uh, contact with uh, people. I only had an experience this morning, for example, I need to renew my uh, car insurance. I had some questions before I went into a chat on the internet where all the insurance companies, of course, now sell their policies, I asked, are you a bot or a real person? Because they have the bots that give you relevant answers. Um, she, as it turned out later, I realized that it's a young woman. She answered- uh, Lucky you. Yes, yeah, she, she was extremely uh, polite, informative. <laughs> I ended up buying the insurance and I gave her- And you bought the insurance. 
<laughs> yes. That's and an effective I, strategy there. And I ended up giving her a five-star rating. <laughs> it happened to me before that I got um, what they call a bot, you know, just automatic answers. And they were so yeah. irrelevant. I just said, you know, switch off and move on somewhere else. I think those skills will, will be important. And I do hope this young woman gets a, a promotion or a pay rise soon because she was exceptionally... Uh, well, I think potentially with the platform that you are now talking about her, it might have a big impact on her career. So <laughs> maybe she she's, some listening. Some she's probably yeah. dealing with someone else who wants insurance maybe, now. Maybe you call again tomorrow. Yes. Um, Listen, um, I would like to ask you something specific about South Africa for, you know, it is a country with incredible polarity. Um, and if we talk about the future of employment, how do we, how would we upskill and reskill people that are really so much in poverty that they hardly have access to, to water and, and to internet and to, you know, Wi-Fi and um, how, how do we, create opportunities to really change that in a, in a country like this. Um, I would maybe ask Chris, you, you can answer and then Joel, I'd like to hear your response as well. Well, it, it, it's, it's a long process, but it needs to get started and it needs to be accelerated. I've, I've, I get to hear these things in meetings like the Davos uh, meetings, the World Economic Forum meetings in Davos where there are representatives from South Africa. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it, it's essential that, uh, that you don't give up and say it's a desperate case. What, what's uh, rather um, uh, unusual, I guess, that you know, especially considering the way that we approach education policy in, in, in our countries in, in Western Europe, is that in places like South Africa, you need to improve the infrastructure of actually going to school, yeah. roads, you know, how you manage it. Uh, you know, provide basic uh, nutrition and clothing, shoes for the people in villages to walk to schools. That's probably more important <clears throat> than, um, than what we do here, for example, which is forcing people to go to school. And if you don't go, your parents are called up and all that. You know, I mean, if you don't have the basics, go to school, then yeah. it don't matter so much. And, and once you get that, that infrastructure of actually attending school, then the rest will come automatically. You know, learning learning is fun, but not when you sit there with an empty stomach and uh, scar, yeah, exactly, uh, or feeling cold, or, or yeah, because you don't have basic clothing. Do you have anything to add that to that, Joel? Well, I would just add. I mean, I totally agree with Chris about this. I mean, it, it, infrastructure really is the the key word here, and um, I would say that if one of the ills that the world is suffering from um, in the last 25 or 30 years, with some notable exceptions, is an imbalance investment. Um, and so the, the counter example to this is China, because what has happened in China is that uh, political decisions to make huge investments in infrastructure have really helped to, to take a country that was truly and abjectly poor and turned it into a middle income country. And, and you, you, you go to China, I've been there a couple of times, you go to China and you see why it's not just infrastructure in roads and in water supplies. It's in, in education, in university, you know, in Shanghai, there are a hundred universities. I mean, it's actually mind boggling. And, um, you know, the, the contrast between a country like China, where, you know, a, a, a strong, autocratic government made a decision we are going to invest in in infrastructure it, that, that, that that's i think a sobering a sobering thought to compare it with a place like india uh, where such a decision was not made and maybe could not have made uh, also who knows and, uh, and 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 the gap is, is is quite striking and i think infrastructure is not just a, a buzzword here in the united states <laughs> where it's now very much on everybody's agenda it should be your question is, is precisely that. It's, it's invest in the physical environment in which these things operate. If you can get that done, I think. Um, yeah, it's, um, it becomes an enabler for, for the basics, right? Exactly. And then, then we can go forward if we have the same, um, something to step off from. 
Okay. Um, yes. Um, we have an interesting question here from a 15-year-old that is asking, how can we effectively develop steady, long-term unemployment? Um, how can we develop so that there is steady, long-term employment for, um, for people over the next five to 10 years? Chris? Yes, sorry, Chris. I was, he, 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 shouldn't, he shouldn't be aiming for one job that is steady long-term, as Joel was saying earlier, in fact, with, with which I agree to a large extent. What, the, 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 best, the best kind of labor market and the best kind of employment you can offer is one where there is frequent turnover of jobs. So you are going from job to job, looking for the one that you're best suited to. Um, you develop your skills with training as, as you go along. Um, what we call in the um, literature, if you like, improving your match with the available jobs. Now, to be able to do that, of course, you need to have the available jobs. So uh, answer to the question, how do we succeed in providing satisfactory employment uh, for everyone, is that it, it goes back to... Uh, infrastructure help uh, from the government provide the right business environment, not only roads and uh, buildings and, and, and schools, but also um, enabling uh, companies to operate in, a, in an environment where they can um, uh, take advantage of the entrepreneurial potential of their managers. Uh, you know, look at the World Bank, uh, uh, doing business index at the World Economic Forum index. South Africa is very low from what I remember. You know, places you get on top about the Northern Europeans, North Americans, um, then next group. Uh, or, and of course, Singapore, Hong Kong, and places like that. Mm -hmm. and, and then below them, the, the rest of Europe and North Africa comes much later. And then, and then you might ask why. I mean, we know exactly how we should do it because all you have to do is to look at what those organizations emphasize is um, conditions that create the right business environment. And once you create, create the right business environment, you create the right jobs as well. One, one very, uh, I'm, I'm not just probably spoken too long, but one, one final thing I should say actually is a, a, a mistake that, that people often make is that when they're talking about jobs and how can we get jobs and all that, and, and then they start thinking, you know, you have to help labor, you have to give, you know, more money to the workers and one thing and the other. In fact, the best way to help workers is to enable businesses to invest and, and create jobs. I mean, job is the best way to support a worker and, and it's the business that will create job and it needs investment to do it. Therefore, if you create the right investment environment, then you help the workers more than anything. Sometimes when I say that, they tell me, oh, you're such a neoliberalist because you studied in, uh, in America and Britain for so long and you've changed in your true You have experience. access to resources. But it's completely, uh, 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 it's so difficult for, for at least those who haven't been trained in economics at least to understand this concept that if you want to work, you help the workers, help business create jobs. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Chris. Joel, um, what is your take on, on upskilling and, and reskilling? And do you have any suggestions on, on, on that? Well, did, I, have, I have, if I may sound one concern, and that is that for much of the world, um, this is actually going to be an increasing problem because the ability to reskill and and um, is very much a function of age and um, increasingly difficult to teach, you know, old dogs new tricks. And as the average age of workers increases with the rest of the population, because the average age worldwide is increasing, uh, this will become an increasing problem. And we have to find ways in which we can do this, not just for workers who are in their 20s and are still a fairly nimble minds, but also people, well, probably not my and Chris's age, but certainly people in their 50s who are still going to be in the labor force for 10, 15, 20 years and whose jobs have become obsolete. 
Now, the, the, the problem of the obsolescence of skills has been a problem with, you know, that's always been there with technological change. And, and the sad thing is that, you know, the, the system adjusts to the need to reskill the, re the population, but very often it's the next generation uh, that gets educated. And so we have now a world that is very much tech oriented, you know, heavily. Uh, uh, heavy use of of virtual and uh, uh, communications and ways of 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 expressing oneself and working and you know the younger you are the easier you are you know you're lots of stories about your know, grandparents being taught how to use their computer by their eight-year-old grandchild and yeah. it's this age effect that i think is is something that we have to pay attention to this to say how do you actually uh, um, get people in their 50s and 60s to unlearn what they know and learn to use them. Yeah, I think I mean, it's, it's quite feasible. I mean, people have you know, ad ad adapted, for instance, quite well to the sudden need to use new skills under the, under the pandemic. You know, millions and millions of people, many of them in, in my age cohort, basically said, look, I can no longer go in front, front of my students and teach, but I know I, I've been taught how to use communications like that and so it's possible but i think this is this is an issue that we really need to worry about i mean and and so you know, one, one of the great fears for instance uh, that was around in this country for a while is if, what happens when we do self-driving cars oh we're gonna have three million truck drivers you know who's gonna be who are going to be Unemployed. I actually don't think that's going to happen. But 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 you know things like that clearly did happen. I mean, think what happens to to elevator operators. You know who who you know hundreds of thousands of people were elevator operators in the 1930s, and then elevators became automated, and we didn't need them anymore. So yeah, then we only had music in elevators. Yeah, and so 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 these people were had to be retrained, and you know many of them I'm sure were retrained, but the ones on the older side of distribution probably had to retire, and you know that's throwing away human capital, which I as an economist sort of really object to, you know. I mean, and 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 so I hate to I hate to throw away resources, but this is something that I think the system is going to have to worry about, and here I I really don't think that the private sector can be relied upon. I think this has to be a matter of public policy, hopefully jointly with the private sector. But I don't think there's going to be a lot of money to be made from retraining people in their 40s and 50s. Um, and so this has to be a matter of, 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 of public policies. But since people in their 40s and 50s vote, um, it's likely that the system will respond. Thank you very much, Joel. Um, I have a question from somebody asking whether um, you can teach someone to take initiative. Do you think it's uh, entrepreneur, you know, to be creative and to to take initiative and to um, to become entrepreneurial? Is that something that can be taught? Um, who, would you like to answer, Chris? Sorry, I'm doing this one, that one, but uh, you can also then just show me uh, you'd rather answer. Taking um, taking initiatives and entrepreneurial initiatives is absolutely essential if the society is going to go forward because that's how uh, you discover uh, new techniques, new management techniques, new production techniques, or whether in new, in new businesses, you know, what you call a startup. And, um, and you may not make the discovery yourself, but if you're entrepreneurial, you can uh, borrow ideas from others, you know, from Silicon Valley or whatever and apply them in your own country now now that that's partly i i believe that as partly a, a sort of inherent gift there are there are people who are entrepreneurial you see them from a very young age they try and, and trade football cards or <laughs> marbles or something with others and and that and, and there are others who are not i'm afraid i belong to the second category i've never been entrepreneurial about anything that's why i became a university professor because you just <laughs> did in office writing when you're a, uh, they, it's a good strategy at least you add value in a different way yeah it was very very wise not going i mean my father had it stopped he was much more entrepreneurial stopped his own business and he wanted me to go into the business and i said to him no if you want the business to survive and if you want me to have a, a reasonable life please don't put pressure on me and that was the end of it but once you um 
uh, once you have that inclination, then, then it comes with, with, with training. You, you, you need to be trained into basic STEM skills, you know, to understand, especially now to understand the new technology. Almost every new idea is, is come from the laptop, from some software. You need to understand how you use that. And you need to understand basic um, management and economics as well, so you know uh, what's, what's going on around you. I mean, we do have, uh, I mean, there are international competitions uh, that involve um, students from the United States, Canada, Britain on, um, on, on uh, entrepreneurial. So, I mean, there's one, the, there's one the Bill Clinton, for example, sponsored, which gives $1 million to students who come up with the best idea how to have a startup that will help relieve poverty in, in poorer countries. And I, and I sit on them as, um, as judge sometimes on behalf of the, of the LSE. And, and I'm astonished, every, every one of them, everyone who wants to do it is, is talking about developing an app which will become very, very successful that can be used on a smartphone. Well, to be able to develop, a fan, uh, uh, to develop an app and have those ideas, you, you need the basic uh, skill in those techniques. These are economic students that I'm talking about. So you think, it, in, sorry. Um, so you think it is skills that can be taught, yes. although you need to be creative in another sense, but there are certain entrepreneurial skills that can be taught. Yeah, you need to be a little bit risk loving. You need to be able to take risks. Uh, yes, poignant. but you know, um, I think like you've already said, the, the pandemic has shown us that all of us can change, even though for some it was easier and they had to learn new things and for some it might have been harder, but we did it. So um, definitely we can change. Um, I have an, another question here about... Can I, sorry, can, about I, can, I throw in, can I throw in one, one reflection uh, on this? Because you asked if, if entrepreneurial skills can be, can be taught. I think it's a bit like music. Um, you know, for music can be taught to almost everybody uh, up to a certain level. Uh, now, the, not everybody who can be taught music will become Mozart, right? I mean, Spoken so. Down. Uh, so you need to have an inherent talent. I mean, I mean I, obviously the, the the requirements are different. And Chris said, uh, you know. Uh, I think said it correctly. You have to be certainly an attitude toward risk, but also, I think uh, a, a few other things. But what is important is the environment in which the entrepreneur functions, and um, and so we, we there are certain environments in which music has flourishes, and so we have to create the economic equivalent of Vienna in the beginning of the nineteenth century for music, you know, in which play, people like Beethoven and Schubert can flourish, and we have created that in the United States, despite everything that's wrong with it. And we have these hugely successful entrepreneurs like Mark Zuckerberg and, 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 and Bill Gates who have made incredible amounts of money. And I think that is in fact necessary to bring this out of people. And um, on, on that note, um, to create this environment, um, we need a policy and countries need to have policies. And, and what do you think a government should consider putting in place for a future world of work policy? Um, Joel? So may I get on one of my hobby horses here? And that is, the, the, you know, the, I don't think the government can create entrepreneurs, I mean, they create, can, can create incentives, you know, tax incentive or whatever. The most important thing is openness. And so you have to give, let people uh, move between countries and within countries freely so that they can go to the place where they can be the most successful. And uh, here in the United States, the contribution of people not born in this country, I'm one of them, by the way, but I'm not an entrepreneur. But, the, but if you look at what's happening in Silicon Valley and you look at what's happening in the frontiers of engineering, of medicine, of information science, you know, the contribution of immigrants is huge. And we have gone through four years of, of truly benighted policies in this country regarding immigration. And uh, the greatness of, 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 of uh, the United States and the countries that have been open to immigrants is to attract the best talents worldwide 
And once the knowledge is created and the business are created, they spill over worldwide. But the ability to people to move about freely is, is absolutely yeah. critical. And to get in the diverse views. I think that is the point. Um, absolutely. All of this is now possible. Chris, would you like to add to that? Yes, actually, I mean, I do. I mean, I do agree entirely with what Joe was saying. But there's there there is more to it. What um, Joe was saying is creating the kind of environment, you know, through public policy, the, the, the environment where talent could flourish. But it, it needs much more than that. Uh, it, it needs, for example, to have good universities and good collaboration between universities and business. Silicon Valley is the best example. It's got Stanford and Berkeley right, like next right next door. Most of us. Um, that graduates from those universities who succeed in Silicon Valley through uh, collaboration. Industry needs to support universities that are going to succeed. We've seen this with, um, with the vaccines, for example. You know, the AstraZeneca is the University of Oxford, with medics, BioNTech is a small research group in Germany with the Pfizer and so on. Um, then you need to have what um, you could call the um, the innovation environment of, of a country generally, there are various de determinants there that tell you what can make sure that, that R&D is more successful uh, than less. But for that, you know, there, there is reports like the Global Innovation Report, which is an annual publication of about 300 pages. It explains to you, it ranks countries and so forth, so forth. And, um, and apart from the United States, which is obviously at, at the top of this uh, collaboration with um, top-notch universities, MIT, Stanford, and so on, and an excellent innovation environment where talent could flourish, you do have extremely successful smaller countries. Uh, Sweden is extremely successful in that. You know, it's, it, it's invented many of the apps that were subsequently <clears throat> bought up, and we think that they're American, but in fact they are not. You know, Skype, Spotify, and all that, they're Swedish. Israel is extremely successful in doing that of the smaller countries. Uh, whereas at, at the same time, you know, within the, the same European Union, you get countries of same size, same levels of education that are extremely unsuccessful in, in achieving that. You know, take Greece and Portugal, for example, and compared with Sweden and Denmark. Both countries of similar size, they all belong to the same union. They're not, and why is that? And that's because their innovation environment, the one that <clears throat> gives you incentives to go in and do it, are not there. Migration is there, and they say, without any successful Portuguese and Greeks who want to work on this, just migrate to Northern Europe. You just get on the train and, and go to Germany or, or further north. Uh, yeah. so, so, you, so you do need to, to have more than just uh, public policy below. You have, if I may add just, just one footnote to that, you know, I mean, you really want to have an environment that encourages people to think outside the box, you know, and and that's not as easy as it sounds because out of sort of not, out of 100 people think outside the box, 99 are going to turn out crackpots and one is going to to be the genius who starts a new industry but you don't know which one so you've got to give everybody a chance to be you know eccentric and yeah. a little bit weird yeah. and you know and, and, and this is particularly strong in israel but chris said about this you know I, I lived in israel for many years and, and and the thing about israel is not that people think outside the box there is no box that's that that's really the best if there's no box then no one can be can be wrong or outside of it um, listen, I would really like to thank you, Joel and Chris. Um, it's been very valuable information and insights that you've shared with us. And um, thank you also to the audience for submitting their questions. Of course, I have a list here of another 35 questions that I, I couldn't get through. Um, so please know that there's a huge interest in, in the future of employment and um, in your professional spheres um, Keep in mind that we are all interested in, in how to make a difference and, and how, how to take things forward. Um, I would just like to ask the audience also to, um, before you leave the session or when you leave the session, please click on the main page to go back to the main event and it will, will restart shortly. Um, so thank you very much, Chris and, and Joel, for, for your time with us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. And Bye-bye.